the recording and we can get going. Okay, well, welcome everyone to the I2B2 Transmart Foundation community meeting for March 2018. Uh, we hold these meetings on the third Tuesday of every month. Uh, during which we give uh, foundation news, uh, some updates, and also often have a guest speaker uh, as we do today. My name is Rudy Potenzone. I do the marketing for the foundation, and we're delighted that you could join us. We are using GoToWebinar, uh, and the session will be recorded, and the recording and the slide deck will be made available uh, within a day or so on our website, and the recording will also be available on our YouTube channel. The agenda to, for today uh, is, is there, and we'll go through a number of topics and updates uh, about the foundation uh, quickly, and then we'll go to a, a really exciting uh, presentation and demonstration of Fractalis, uh, which is the uh, the new and improved version uh, of SmartR for those who know SmartR. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, our executive director, Diane Kia. Diane? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining. Um, wherever you are in the U.S. or, or around the world, um, if you happen to be in Boston, um, just a little complaint from me. We're uh, facing our fourth nor'easter um, in the month of May or month of March. Um, and I just heard on the news that we're expecting another eight to 12 inches of snow tomorrow. So, um, <laughs> so hopefully at our next call, it'll be spring and the tulips will be up and, uh, and we'll kind of get out of this craziness. Um, so uh, Rudy, why don't, you, why don't you go to the next slide? Let me go through the, the um, foundation news quickly um, and talk about, the, um, and talk about uh, what's going on. Um, so just a reminder, uh, the foundation is really up about the community Putting a, pulling the community together. You know, we're supporting the I2B2 and the Transmart um, platforms um, and, and really promoting the development, but it's really all about pulling um, this community together and providing, um, you know, education and knowledge and, um, and, and uh, for this group. So next slide. So, uh, Coming up um, in the next few months, we're going to be doing a, a board nominations um, and elections by the members. Um, so pull, pull the next slide, Rudy, and I'll kind of explain the, um, the governance. So this is just a reminder of the governance model for the foundation. Um, at, at the bottom, you see the members. So we have a member group, and um, members are uh, able to nominate new members and that happens in the fall um, in the spring we have a board nomination so um, half of the board members um, uh, will roll off um, and uh, the members will actually uh, elect new members so if you go to the next slide rudy i'll remind you of the folks who are currently um, on our board of directors um, we have uh, Four, four people that were from the original I2B2 Foundation that are on the board, um, four from the uh, Transmart Foundation, um, and then independent directors from, um, from uh, Europe and also uh, Julie from, um, from the US. So the way it'll work is of these 11 directors, um, five of them are um, slated to roll off. Um, now they, they can nominate themselves to be reelected um, to the board. Um, or they could decide um, uh, not to to uh, to be nominated, um, and the members are able to nominate uh, new members. So, if you go to the next slide, Rudy, I'll just give folks a an idea of the timeline. Okay, so this is really happening uh, around the month of May. We'll we'll um, start to kick off this process. Um, and send out information to the, the members um, about uh, the nomination process. Um, we'll be creating ballots in June um, and sending the ballots to the members. Um, and the election will be on June 13th. Uh, what we want is we want the new board members to be in place for the, uh, the June meeting and the, the next board meeting on the 27th. So for those of you uh, on the call who are um, members, if you, um, 
you know, want to start to think about um, folks that you think would be um, really valuable to be part of the board of directors, please do that. Um, and you'll be hearing to, uh, from us um, in May. Next slide. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the June meeting. So I'm really, um, you can jump to the next slide, Rudy. I'm really excited about how the June meeting is, um, is shaping up this year. We're doing, we're doing it a little bit different than we have in um, prior years. Um, so it's a two-day conference. Um, before it was kind of split, there was one day that was I2B2, um, and then there was one day tra um, Transmart. So what we're doing now is we're, we're kind of splitting it up. The first day will be a, a group of high-level speakers um, that will talk about the use of the foundation platforms and other, you know, really um, exciting topics. I think we have a, a lineup of some great people, and I'll show I'll show you that on the next slide. And the second day is going to be, you know, a full day of targeted workshops. And these workshops are going to be, you know, in smaller groups, you know, smaller rooms where people can really, um, you know, interact and um, and, and learn. Um, the last few uh, meeting, AMIA meetings I was at, people really talked about the fact that they wanted um, more focused um, groups where people could really learn um, and take away some very um, practical, tactical things um, to support the, the, the platform. So Rudy, if you jump to the next slide, I'll walk through quickly the speakers. Um, and you can, you can sign up for the, um, the conference on our website. Um, and you can you can review these speakers. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but here are the first three. Um, I think many of you know um, Zach Ohani, um, who's a, a professor at at, Har at um, Harvard Medical School, who was the PI of uh, of I2B2. Um, so he'll be speaking. Um, John Halamka is uh, another um, really. Uh, international um, internationally known um, innovator. He's He's very focused on um, uh, standards and using standards to support a lot of the massive data that's out there. Um, and and, uh, and George Church, George Church is you know the the, fa the father of genomics. Um, so he's going to be looking at um, you know open source integration um, you know between 2005 and 2025. So he he's also a, a, a really ex exciting speaker. So next slide. Um, Eric Perales, he's he's going to be talking about open source, um, using open source data and, and open data. Um, uh, Becky is focused on, you know, uh, delivering solutions to support um, renal translational uh, research. Uh, Paul Aviak, um, this is going to be pretty exciting. We just saw a preview of the first uh, uh, beta um, release of the I2B2 Transmart. Um, platform, uh, which you'll hear about a little bit more um, from in Sasha's talk. And then um, Sean Murphy will be talking about big data and also the uh, integration with I2B2 and the Jupyter Notebook. So pretty ex exciting stuff for the first day. And the second day is here are the breakout sessions that we're talking about. I think a lot of you know we um, have pulled together these working groups, um, user interfaces, ontologies, and ETL. Um, I think we may have one on uh, training as well. Um, we're working on the details of this, but these working groups have been meeting on a regular basis, and we'll be reporting out and and pulling a, pulling more groups together. Um, we've got some special interest groups um, that we're pulling together. Um, the uh, ACT um, accrual for clinical trials, which is a sort of the next. Uh, iteration of Shrine, um, and it, which is really, really focused on using a Shrine federated um, query network to support um, clinical trials. Um, we'll, we're working on hackathons using Glowing Bear and, you know, sort of additional hackathons. Um, and then we'll also have a, a, a session where we're just talking, you know, about um, the development of, of I2B2 Transmart and the I2B2 Transmart platforms. So very exciting. Um, and jump to the next slide, Rudy. Um, if you haven't signed up and you plan on coming, please um, please go to our website and, and register. That would be great. Um, and uh, we, we can give you additional information about day two in, in uh, future calls. So next slide, Rudy. Uh, 
Um, and Rudy, I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, and one of the important parts of, of you know, is running these meetings, they, they do cost uh, a bit of money. And so we're looking for a sponsorship. We're putting together a sponsorship program. If you organization or, you know, organizations who might be interested, please uh, let us know. Uh, we try to give sponsors of the of our programs uh, visibility, both, you know, before the meetings, at the meetings themselves uh, and after the event. And so, you know, we're looking, uh, obviously, for a number of sponsors uh, who can come and help us uh, defray some of the costs uh, of the, the program. Uh, we are actively, you know, going to approaching uh, appropriate companies uh, for their sponsorship. But uh, if anybody knows anyone or has uh, their, their organization uh, might be interested, please let us know. The other uh, the, the kind of last thing we wanted to talk about for Foundation News is that we have kicked off our 2018 training program uh, this year. New this year, which is exciting, is that uh, I2B2 um, training has been added. Uh, this is our third year of training. We've trained over 400 people. Uh, the trainings are uh, webinars that are held the last Monday of every month. Um, and uh, this year, we're starting our first one uh, this, this month in March. Uh, and it will take place next week, next uh, Monday. Um, please register if you can, uh, if you're interested. Uh, this will be an I2B2 for beginners um, program uh, on um, Monday, uh, being taught by the uh, folks of the University of Kansas Medical Center uh, who have um, spoken at these before. All of our training is donated by uh, our supporters. Um, this include Rancher Bioscience, Clarivate Analytics, The Hive, uh, University of Kansas Medical Center, Partners Healthcare, and Harvard Medical School. Uh, and just a, a quick uh, preview, here's the cl training uh, classes that are scheduled uh, for the rest of the year. Uh, and you can see there are, oops, going automatically, there's some uh, topics uh, on uh, Transmart and some advanced topics uh, and introductory pieces, training on I2B2, including some advanced classes. Um, and, um, um, you know, other topics. So, uh, you know, we're we're also going to be having an interesting session on the ITB2 Transmart platform. So that's that's what we've had for the training program. Uh, now we'll move to our guest speaker for today. Uh, Sasha Herzinger from the University of Luxembourg uh, has been spending the last three months uh, in uh, at Harvard University, um, Harvard Medical School, working in Paula VX Laboratory. Uh, sorry about the weather, <laughs> uh, Sasha. But um, he's going to give us a presentation on the, um, the work he's been doing on Fractalis. Uh, Sasha? Yeah, I'm here. OK, let me change you to the presenter. So you should have the screen. All right. Um, there you go. OK, yes, I, I do see it. OK, perfect. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. And yes, the weather is indeed horrible here. <laughs> uh, I've never seen half a meter of snow in that frequent uh, intervals. <laughs> um, so um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm essentially the person who um, started SmartR, which was a visual analytic plugin for Transmat 16.2. And um, before you start leaving the meeting, today I'm not going to talk about Smart R. Um, I know I have given a lot of presentations on that, and probably a lot of you are sick about hearing of this. So today I'm showing something different. Um, so Fractalis. Um, Fractalis is an open source service for platform independent interactive visual analytics. So I will explain you now what all these words mean. So that being said, um, for those of you who don't know Smarter, Smarter was essentially, um, like you see here, um, these uh, analytics or these charts that are within Transmart and that are backed uh, with statistical computations uh, that were performed via R, the statistical language R. And uh, you could interact with these charts and do all sorts of fancy things. Um, but the future of Smarter um, has to solve some uh, issues. So one is it must resolve the platform binding issue. Um, for those of you who know a little bit about um, uh, the technical aspects of developing such a platform, the issue is that 
each uh, translational uh, research platform has their own data formats. So, for instance, the BioPortal will have completely different data than I2B2 has, and I2B2 has different data formats than Transmart has. And um, when you also, they all have different UIs. So, whenever you code something for these platforms, um, you make it very platform dependent and that is an issue because especially right now we have Transmit 16.2, we have Transmit 17.1 which will be released uh, soon I think. We will have uh, the I2B2 Transmit, we have I2B2, we have Cloing Bear, we have Borderline, we have the Transmit Up interface. So you see where I'm getting. We have so many different platforms and um, uh, you, the solution for Smarter must be uh, more portable. So also it needs a much more scalable solution than R or Azurf. Um, for those of you who work often with R, you probably use it as some sort of scientific calculator, I call it. So you maybe have 50, 100 lines of R code uh, for, for you know, uh, some standard analysis. But when you have thousands of line of R code, things really start to fall apart and this becomes very, very difficult to debug and manage. Um, and since Smarter relies on R, there is a problem there. Also, because of the changing interfaces, state changing, AT, uh, changing APIs and changing data formats, uh, these platforms for visual analytic, which Smarter is, uh, need a lot of maintenance. So the only conclusion for me was that I have to start from square one um, and don't and solve these issues essentially. So Fractalis um, wants to address a, a couple of, of things. So it wants to be very, very scalable. So, and by scalable, I mean, it can support hundreds of users in parallel. Um, I, it must be extendable. So you don't, shouldn't need, you know, a super deep knowledge about um, uh, how fractalis components work, about all sorts of APIs. It, you sh essentially, if you can write Python, you should be able to add your own analysis, analysis, right? So that's also a goal. It should be platform independent. I don't want that fractalis works any different in 17.1 than it would work in I2B to Transmart or um, you know, some other platform which has even nothing to do with I2B2 or Transmart. So it should be completely platform independent. It should be robust to changes. Um, so if a data format changes, I don't want to change all the R scripts that depend on this data format. So there needs to be some sort of abstraction layer between the incoming data and uh, what Fractalis does with this data. It should be well-documented and well-tested. Um, also, it should be simple to integrate. And by simple to integrate, I mean that uh, ideally you spend a couple of days and you have Fractalis in your own service um, so that there is very, very little friction with an existing service. This is not only, you know, to uh, to have it working with other services, but this is also very, very um, fortunate for if, 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 if it's just supporting uh, I2B to Transmit, for instance, if it would just support this service, even then we would profit from the simple integration because uh, all bugs that um, would, all bugs of Fractalis and Transmit would be isolated to this small point of friction between the two platforms. So, um, so how the general idea behind this is that we have one time, um, a front-end component, so a JavaScript library which visualizes statistics, and we have a back-end, a computational node that computes the statistics that will be visualized. Um, you would include this front-end library, this JavaScript library, in some service. We don't really care about which service. In this case, it's I2B2 Transmart, but it could also be another one. The only requirement is really that this service comes with a data API. And then you would extract the data into your computational backend and you would compute the statistics, maybe, I don't know, correlation coefficient, and then you would visualize the, the data. Now, the pro is that we have now an external analytical component, but this doesn't really solve the issue because the APIs are very specific to service A and the data formats are very specific to service A. That means whatever is within this computational node is still very, very tightly bound to service A. 
So this is not the solution, but this is the first step to the solution. Now, let's consider this picture for a moment, where we have Transmart 16.2, 17.1, and I2B2 Transmart. All of those platforms have a different API. Um, all of those platforms have different data formats. So one thing which will be the same is how you visualize the data. Because I can, I because my computational node is now external, I can assure that whatever it outputs is always of the same format. That means these front-end libraries always can, always know how to visualize, how to create these charts. So it's this similar approach to, let's say, shiny, plotly, bokeh, high charts, just with a computational backend in this case. The other part of the solution is, um, so you see there is some white square here, right? Um, white space. The solution to this problem uh, of different services with different APIs and formats is um, something that I call micro ETLs. So um, instead of having your standard ETL, which will migrate an entire database, these micro ETLs know how to talk with the respective service and how to extract the data transform it into a, fractal, a fractalis internal standard format and then load it into an analytical cache, which uh, then can be used to compute, the, uh, to run the same analytical scripts on the, on the data which come from different data sources. Um, if I go a little bit into detail, um, this is essentially the, um, the architecture of Fractalis. So I'm not uh, spent, I will not spend a lot of time here because unless I will get some questions after this presentation, but essentially this entire thing is a Python framework, which is based on Flask with RabbitMQ as a job broker or a message broker, uh, Redis as a cache and um, result backend, and Celery as computational, um, like Celery is essentially the horsepower be behind all of this. And Celery is uh, a distributed job uh, system. That means if you uh, get, if you're limited by, um, by the number of CPUs you have on one server, then you can, or on one VM, you can distribute, you can spawn the Celery workers on several VMs and uh, uh, Fractalis can use all of them to, um, in order to serve many users at the same time. So, but I will not go into detail how this works for now. So what I will be showing now is the following. Um, you have one times the user interface, your really standard transmit up user interface, and you have um, a I2B2 transmit backend with uh, NHANES uh, data sets. This is some, I don't know what, um, what NHANES stands for. It's something like national health, service something, uh, essentially um, body measurements, uh, weight measurements, um, lots of questionnaires. It's, it's a very interesting data set with 40,000 patients. So that's, uh, that's a quite interesting data set to test um, things on. Um, I2B to Transmart will be using Picture as an API to get data out of Transmart. Uh, Picture is an API that is developed here within uh, Harvard Medical School by Paul's group. And they use it, um, it's essentially sort of a meta API that can query different services um, uh, via a single API. And Fractalis uses this API to get the data out of Transmart. It will take from the interface, it will take the parameters. So for instance, Please compute me a box plot between age and body mass index uh, for the with a Pearson correlation coefficient, and then it will calculate the results and send these results to the front end to the user interface, where they will be then visualized. Um, that's essentially it for the slides. I have. Again, this is these are backup slides. So if you are interested in how this works, please, if there is any developers out there in this call, ask me questions after uh, I'm done with the presentation, and I would love to spend some time explaining how this thing works and what problems these um, all these boxes here solve. Um, and 
because I will forget it otherwise here's already my last slide to so before I give the demo um, just thank you to my colleagues at the LCSP in Luxembourg at uh, the DBMI Harvard Medical School here and of course all of the people that I've worked together with during the past years that brought me to this point so I have the knowledge to develop this platform so um, without further ado I will switch interface um, Okay, that, that's big enough. Rudy, that's big enough, right? Okay. Okay, I hear no one. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Very sorry. Yeah. yeah, okay, so... <laughs> um, there were still people in the call, so I, uh, I don't think there would be still so many people if uh, I would have talked, I would have been muted in the last couple of minutes. <laughs> so uh, just for the demo of this presentation, to make things a little bit quicker, I will choose a rather small subset here. But in the end, you will see a big subset. You will see all 40,000 patients, just so you can see that it still works. So I will choose just um, the Hispanic uh, group out of this, uh, out of this study. And I will go to Fractalis. Now you will see um, some sort of loading bar. That's it, and it's already gone. So that was essentially Fractalis asking for the patient IDs that I just selected. Um, now you right now in Fractalis, there is just a couple of analytics because I'm focusing on having a very stable and well-tested platform. And once this proves to be stable enough, I will add in a rather rapid pace new analytics. So. Um, but bear with me, it will still be interesting, even if um, you know what a box plot and a correlation or a scatter plot is. So for now, um, you also see this little box here. So what this box is, it's um, the text on the sides should describe this. Um, what you do is you want to tell Fractalis which kind of variables you are interested in, because Fractalis will prepare that and loads these variables into a data cache, into an analysis cache. So um, this repeated analysis that Fractalis does will happen in a much quicker pace than, um, so you don't essentially don't need to download the data all the time again. Also, um, you see here now, these variables, they started flashing. At least I hope you see it because I know that um, this remote presentations are sometimes a bit laggy. So I will also, um, upload a video to YouTube in one of the next days in case this lags too much for you guys. Uh, but what you see is that these variables flash for a moment and then they stop flashing. What this means is um, that Fractalis is currently downloading this data and uh, via picture and as soon as it stops flashing, um, as soon as it stops flashing, it means that the data, are, they are available in Fractalis. Okay, so we just took a couple of um, numerical variables. Now we take a couple of categorical ones. So let's just say we take the sex, so female and male. And you see here that in the categorical box, um, you have now these uh, two variables flashing. So that means they're currently being downloaded. Now let's just create a couple of uh, correlation or scatter plots. So let's plot H versus systolic and H versus DS2 like. Something that you immediately notice is that there is no run button and no download button or fetch button involved. That's because um, Fractalis scales so well that I thought that you don't really want to press a button every single time you want to do something. Um, if things turn slow, you should ideally just throw more CPUs at it, right? Because um, in my opinion, this massively uh, improves the user experience. For instance, if I go now to the left side in this plot here, I can just say, please show me male versus female, you know, and you, you don't want to press a fetch button or a run button, you know, and then you have maybe a parameter wrong and you want to reselect it, you know, you want to do these things really on the fly. So as you can see here, I'm just changing like my correlation method. Uh, uh, I change the categorical variables uh, without really, um, you know, it's it's, it flows much better this way. Um, let's just add two more. So things 
uh, look maybe a little bit more impressive. And there is something wrong with this data set. So let me remove this real quick. Um, so I'm not showing any particular, um, uh, how, how to say this? I'm not showing you like how you should do your research um, or any um, any variables of interest right now. Um, but I'm preparing, or we are preparing a, a demo where we demonstrate how you could use this to find uh, values of interest. Um, right now, this is more technical presentation and show you the things that you can do, not so much uh, what the data show you, just in case you're wondering why I'm, what I'm doing here. Um, so one thing that's really special about Fractalis is that it will connect all of these plots um, with each other. That means if I say, please give me only the patients that are younger than 50, which I'm doing here with this selection, and then I let the mouse button go, you will see that instantly all of these plots, they will adapt to my current selection. So I could also say, please now give me only the patients who have a certain blood pressure. And you see that even based on my first selection, I can, do make, uh, I can make a second selection, so a sub-selection, and all of these plots um, will immediately update the correlation values, the p-values, and you will see um, you will see uh, the updated uh, the updated values. So um, there is also box plots. So let's add two box plots here. Uh, maybe one age, sex versus uh, male versus uh, female, and another box plot about blood pressure. So. Um, what I have shown here also works with uh, with the box plots. So you see here that you have now a couple of box plots for this data, and you can also what I do right now is I click on the male box plot, and you see that all of my charts they instantly um, update themselves to only display my male. Uh, population. Uh, you can see this especially in the upper left one because if you remember uh, at the start I, s I tagged these points male and female so you only see the male ones now which you also see in this um, in this legend here. Uh, speaking of the legend uh, one thing I that always annoys me when I create a plot is that these legends can turn really really big if you have multiple subsets multiple categories you know and a lot of values they are always in the way so they're no longer in the way because now you can track them around and you just place them wherever you feel comfortable with those. Um, the last thing that I would show is the principal component analysis. So I will just throw all my variables that I have right now in here. And um, what you would usually do is you would color them. And for some reason, this doesn't work right now. But I guess that's... Uh, should actually color them. I don't know why it does not. Ah, true, because I am only male right now, yeah. Yeah, much better. So uh, what happened here is uh, I select, I, as a previous selection was still active, so there were, uh, there were only one type of points here. That's why I was confused for a moment. Um, so what I try with Fractalis is I try to link all the uh, analytical parameters directly to these um, to this control panel that you have uh, on the right side here. So this is especially useful for things like a PCA because you can um, you can change the axis which principal components you want to see. Ideally, uh, ideally you only want to see uh, principal component one versus two or zero versus one in this case. But um, very often, the first principal component is maybe something like a batch effect, um, in which case you are more interested in principal component one versus two. So with Fractalis, you can really quickly switch your X and Y axis and then continue your analysis, hope that you see some clusters, select subsets, and see if you just get some statistics, um, you know, and you just, um, Essentially, the whole idea is that you can very, very quickly get an idea of how your data look like, 
you can quickly identify variables of interest, generate hypotheses, and once you are done with these things, you can download the data and you know run your uh, leaf one out cross validation, which runs for months or something like this. So um, this is really all about hypothesis generation. Um, and my 20 minutes are up, so that's pretty much what I wanted to show you today. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. So that's it. Okay, great, Sasha. Thank you very much. Um, we're open uh, for questions. Uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, you can put a, a um, note in the question window, or you can type something in the chat window. So please, uh, if you have any questions, please do so now. Yeah, seeing it for the second time, Sasha, it's really very impressive. Uh, the performance is just incredible. Yeah, thank you. It was it was actually one of the main goals of this entire thing to make it v perform very very well because yeah. I know how bothersome it is to wait for these statistics. Yep. Also, I should mention um, this might look very complicated. Um, in fact, <laughs> it is to a certain extent quite complicated, but um, it is very very easy to install and get it running so uh, there is already docker images there is docker compose files so um, you can um, this whole i2b2 picture enhance fractalis setup you can ideally get this running with a couple of commands you don't have to install all the r dependencies and wow. things like this um, fractalis itself is uh, also comes with a docker compose file but um, even if you don't want to use Docker, it's still very, very easy to install because I have an automated pipeline which publish um, Python packages to the Python package index. So all you have to do is pip install fractalis and then yum or apt get install redis and rabbitmq and then you're already almost good to go. So I don't do much more when I develop. So this is really, really simple to set up despite how it looks. Super. Um, Stephen Wicks is asking, where can we get um, our hands on these Docker images? Um, oh, okay. So um, I think uh, Paul said yesterday that, um, I don't remember, yesterday in the PMC, Paul said something about when those will be available. Um, yeah. I think very, very soon, probably within the next two weeks or something like this. Yeah, what what it what he said yesterday was about four weeks, three or four weeks. We sh he's hoping to have this oh, ready for a, a f an initial beta. Yeah. So the fractalis ones are already here, but um, in all honesty, fractalis is um, fractalis is a supportive app service, so it will not do much without data that you load into it. Yep. So I'm working on a standalone version to test these things right now, but um, you will want to wait for Paul's images, really. Yeah. Um, and uh, Keith, Keith Elston's asking, right, is this, this is running on a local host? Have you tested it on the internet? And how's the performance? Haha, <laughs> you say this is running on local host, but it's not. Ah, so okay. this, um, okay, actually this is half of the truth. This here is running on local host. Fractalis itself actually runs over the internet. And um, I mean, you have seen how well it performs. So um, there is there is almost no delay at all. In fact, I can, you should still be able to see me switching this. Do you see a lot of yes. code now? Yeah. Yeah, so if you see here, the fractalis node is actually not localhost. The fractalis node is one of our um, AWS instances. So this already runs over the internet. Only the transmat is running locally, but this all goes over network still. Great. And the license is Apache 2. Apache 2.0. <clears throat> and uh, no, it's it's uh, are open development or closed. So. Um, 
from experience uh, when i released smarter for the first time i had the issue that it, i was not feeling that it was um ready and i got a lot of feedback and a lot of this feedback was this is missing and that doesn't work and that put me under a lot of pressure so what i want to do now is i want to make um with the people that know already about this make stable that it's uh make sure that it's very stable and that these um, these few workflows actually work flawlessly and once this is done which will probably be in a month or two so very very soon uh, this entire thing will become open source and stay open source under the apache 2.0 license um, and yes it will be um, open development in the sense people can contribute if they want to so i'm completely open to this so or we are completely open to this i hope that answers your question yeah i actually yeah, I know there is some there is some issues with uh, with a GPL license. Um, if you if you want to work uh, it in right. if you want to work with it in in uh, closed environments. So um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Super. Thank thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation, and I just love the demo. Um, so I think we're all anxious to get our, our hands on the uh, the Docker images. Okay. So um, we can open up now um, to uh, other questions. Uh, anything? Anything that we've covered today? Uh, anyone have any questions about anything? Um, Keith's asking the questions, which directors are rolling off the board this year? I don't actually have that in front of me. Diane, do you happen to know the answer to that? Yeah, I, I don't have that in front of me. Um, either Keith, I can send that to you. We'll have once, you know, when we when we introduce the, the overall process within the next couple of weeks, we'll have all that, you know, nailed down. Um, you know, as usual, participation is, is key for the foundation. And so having your, you know, your continuing interest, your suggestions um, is, is really great, great help for us. Um, so we please ask you to, you know, continually let us know um, what kinds of things you'd be looking for uh, from the foundation, your comments, uh, et cetera. Uh, certainly um, the the meeting coming up at Harvard is, is, uh, is you know, really uh, a big you know, meeting for us. Uh, last year, we were oversubscribed. We had 220 people actually had registered for the, the program and over 180 showed up. Um, and we're, uh, you know, the registration is open. So we encourage you to register early uh, if you're planning to attend. Diane, any closing remarks? Um, everybody, thanks. Thanks for joining. And um... Uh, definitely, we hope we'll see you in um, in June, and uh, hopefully next month um, we'll have good weather. Okay, thanks again, everybody. <laughs>